Most of us have never been in a terrible storm at sea, but almost all of us can imagine the tear of being in one. Our generation tends to fly over the seas rather than go through them. Uh, Martin Luther writes, the human heart is like a ship on a stormy sea, driven about by winds blowing from all four corners of heaven. And we understand his meaning. Uh, we know the raging fury of, the, of a heart tossed back and forth between joy and, and fear, wonder and worry, anxiety and anger, delight and despair. Uh, we do not need to experience a storm at sea to understand the metaphor. But we will never fully appreciate it unless we have stood on that deck of that ship where wave after wave after wave comes hurling at that defenseless ship. We can appreciate the storm imagery, but never grasp the tear and the fear of night after night at sea without food or drink, fully at the whim of the waves. There is no control when you are at in a storm at sea. You are defenseless. All you have are those who are with you. G.K. Chesterton wrote, We are all in the same boat, in a stormy sea, and we owe each other a terrible loyalty. When you live through a storm together, a depth is developed as you pray for deliverance, as you cling to one another for survival. Uh, you pray for safety from the raging tempest. In the middle of an ocean, we know that there's a crystal clear that there is only one who can help you. In times of despair, in the times of utter hopelessness, that's when we often discover faith. In recent days, I've talked to numerous people who share their testimony to me, and they'll say, I became a Christian when my life started crumbling, when I lost someone who was, was close to me. Now, there may be some of you here who are experiencing storms, maybe storms of circumstance, maybe storms in your own soul. Regardless, I pray that when you face the storm and you're tossed to and fro, that you realize that there is only one who can say, peace, be still. And he will be the one who leads you to still waters. And if you remember where we are in the book of Acts, the Lord stood by Paul in the barracks after his arrest in Jerusalem and said, Take courage, as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, you shall do the same in Rome. Now Paul knows he must go to Rome, and he knows that he will get to Rome. Why? Because God has spoken, and God will always be true to his word. He knows God will bring him to that destination safely. But to this today, we get to kind of take notice of those first two words that the Lord gave Paul. Take courage. So we get to study the Apostle Paul, how he took courage on his journey while he was tossed to and fro at sea. There's five points as we kind of walk through these 44 verses. The first is a deliverance from the seas, a deliverance from the seas. <clears throat> Many today want to doubt the, the historical accuracy of the Bible. Uh, we live in a postmodern era, and we, we want to, the Bible's often under attack. Uh, they often doubt the historicity of the, of the text of Scripture without even reading it. Most classically trained historians have actually little doubt of the accuracy of the Bible, in, in many ways because of passages like Acts 27 and the details that Luke provides of, of what happens in a storm. We pick up our text this morning in Acts 27, verse 1. And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy on our way to Rome, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship, the Adramitium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. So Luke highlights that the centurion, Julius, who will be in charge of the transport. Uh, he also mentions Aristarchus, who was a, a fellow prisoner along with Paul, mentioned in Colossians and Philemon. Uh, 
Now, as you listen to this account, Luke draws out how incredibly long and taxing this journey to Rome will be. Now, there's multiple cities you'll hear as this, the account goes on, and you'll have to change ships, and you'll see the challenge of the weather. And I think what Luke's trying to do for you here, he's trying to remind you of the beginning of the book in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, really the outline of the entire book. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. It's as if Luke is showing how Paul, through the help of the Holy Spirit, is going to take the gospel to the end of the earth. If not literally, then at least metaphorically. This trip would seem like they were going to the end of the earth. Look at verse 3. The next day, we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Sicilia, and Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. This is the, the second ship. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon, kept coasting along with difficulty, and we came to a place called Fair Havens near which was the city of Lassia. So they boarded the, the second ship. They began with difficulty with the weather. So much of the ancient travel depended upon the weather. Uh, the weather had a pattern to it, uh, so you only traveled at certain seasons. It always kind of guided when you should travel. And even though there was a pattern, it was still very unpredictable. So we pick it up in verse 9. Since much time had passed, the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to send the winter there, the majority decided to put out to sea from there, on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. Now, it says the centurion did not listen to Paul, but preferred to listen to the wisdom of the pilot of the ship. And we want to say, of course. Now, we know the Apostle Paul, he, he's, a, he's a prophet, he's he one who speaks the truth, and yet he's a prisoner on this ship. Of course, the centurion is going to listen to the captain over a prisoner on board. Now, the centurion undoubtedly knew who Paul was. They knew that he would claim to be a prophet. They knew why he was on this ship. But the decisions on the sea should be left and given to the professionals until it was beyond professional help. Verse 13, now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along creek close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind, called the Northeaster, struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. So a tempestuous wind called the northeaster, the, the Greek word there is the, way, the word we get for typhoon, and in verse 15, Luke display, or explains that they're, they're no longer in control of the ship. It says they were driven along. This is that in verse 15, and again in verse 17. Uh, they were afraid that the ship was going to, to be sunk at, on the Sirtis, the this is a combination of sandbars and shoals off the North African coast. It was 400 miles from where they began. Now, the site was known as a graveyard for vessels. 
as you can see right here in verse 17, things are not going well. Now Luke writes this account as an eyewitness, as a fellow traveler. And as you read this account, you can almost sense the growing desperation. It's hard to really put ourselves in the mix of that boat, but just try, if you will, to to feel what they were feeling as the waters and the winds kept on getting rougher and rougher. Look at verse 18. Hear the language. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Let's go back and read those verses again. Just feel the emotional state of the crew. It says, since we were violently storm-tossed, they began to jettison the cargo. You know, when you start throwing things overboard, you're doing everything you can just to survive. And the whole time, you're rocking back and forth, violently being thrown against the sides of the ship. The crew and the prisoners were probably getting sick. They were probably so sick to their stomach that they would not even want to eat. Their equilibrium, their balance was, was gone. Then it says, on the, on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. Uh, the boat was probably taking on water, and they were trying to lighten the load even more so the, the, water would, uh, the boat would rise and be light on the water. The gear was probably spare gear, possibly even the main, the main sail. And it says this was the, the third day. Now, it was only the third day, but it was still the third day. Can you imagine experiencing these temptuous winds in complete darkness and probably with, with no sleep for one day, then again for a second day, then again for the third day? Most of us would not, would not have made it past the first day, and here we are at the third day. And it gets worse in verse 20, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us. All hope, all hope of being saved was at last abandoned. You can almost feel the emotion. You can feel the desperation. After the third day, no sun, no stars, no light, being tossed violently back and forth, all hope of survival was lost. All hope of seeing a a loved one, all hope of seeing land again was at last abandoned. Even those who were holding out hope for survival, the most optimistic among them realized there was no chance of escape. Total and utter darkness with the fury of a violent storm, all hope was at last abandoned. Everyone gave up. Well, almost everyone. Number two, we see the deliverance by the Savior, deliverance by the Savior. So often, we see this time and time again throughout history, when all hope seems lost, the Lord shows up. And while the tempest rages on, when temptation claims the battle, it seems the night has won. Christ, the sure and steady anchor, is still with us. Look at verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you, have, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have told you, as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. So Paul stands up. He's among the crew. And he tells them to take heart that they are going to live. 
Now remember, we just read the previous verse when all hope at last was abandoned. Yet Paul tells them that not one person will lose their life. All will survive. Why? Because God says so. Look at verse 23. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong, whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. Paul had to believe God's word against all hope of what he saw. The circumstances had not changed. The the, the waves were still pounding against the the ship. They were still being rocked back and forth. They They were still in utter darkness. And yet, Paul believed. In the midst of extremely dire circumstances, Paul believed God's word. Beloved, I hope that encourages you today. I hope your faith will not waver in disbelief, but you'll be fully convinced that God is able to do what he has promised. God told Paul, you will testify in Rome. And since God said it, nothing can stop it. Paul belonged to God. This was the foundation of his confidence. The foundation of his confidence was that he belonged to God, that God was with him. For the Christian, there is always hope. Even the darkness of 14 days at sea is nothing to the utter darkness that covered Jerusalem as Jesus hung on the cross, taking on the sin of the world on that first Black Friday. He shouted, it is finished. It is finished. And breathed his last. He gave up his spirit and died. The sinless Son of God was dead and was buried. Everyone thought it was the end. It appeared that death had won. But God's word said that the the Messiah must suffer and the third day rise from the dead. And God's word never returns void, it always accomplishes its purpose. Paul believed God's word in the midst of the storm because God's word had already been proven true in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because remember, Paul saw the risen Christ on the way to Damascus. He believed. Beloved, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? If God has met your greatest need in Christ, why do you doubt him with lesser things? There is no logical reason for Paul to have hope on that ship. But he did have hope because he believed God's word. Beloved, do you believe God's word. See, God knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. We get anxious. We get fearful. We get worried. And he is kind to remind us of his word. He's kind to send us those reminders through his word, through through friends, and to Paul, through an angel of God, to say, do not be afraid. He wants us to trust him. So why don't we? You know, the things that I'm even saying today as I was writing this sermon, I'm thinking, you know, Dave, you, you've said this to your church time and time again. It, it seems like basic Christianity, right? That in the storms of life, trust God. Believe God's word. And yet I'm saying it again, why? It's because we so often don't trust God when things get hard. We don't trust God when circumstances tend to get difficult. When the storms of life tend to come at us, we tend to doubt that God is good. Doubt that he is for us. I know that there are hopeless situations like troubled marriages, depleted finances, wayward children, failing health. And in those times, it is hard to believe God's word. And yet, what is harder than raising the dead? Beloved, there's always hope in Christ. We have to lift our eyes off of our circumstances 
for the hope that we have in eternal life. Friend, if you're here and you're not following Jesus as Savior, let me just ask you, what hope do you have? I mean, truly and honestly, when you close your eyes in death, what will you cling to? What will you hope for? What will you trust on that day? I mean, Jesus Christ is a kind and gentle Savior. He wants to save you. And if you turn to him today, you will be forgiven. If you call upon him as Lord, he will delight to save you, as you've already heard. He invites you to come and follow him. He is a kind and gentle Savior. But he's also just. Sin must be punished. He offers to take it for you. But will you accept it? Or will you wait for that day when you will experience the fury of the storm? Well, not only do you see the Savior delivering us, which is ultimately what we, we see in this entire text, we also see a deliverance by the centurion. I think this is important for, Paul, for Luke's point of why he's writing the book of Acts. Deliverance by the centurion. God reassures Paul that he will be saved, for he has a very specific task for him to accomplish. Friends, God will not call you home until his work for you on this earth is is done. Paul's confidence in Christ starts to affect the centurion. The centurion can no longer trust the, the pilot of the ship because he has no control anyway. The boat is driven along. He must turn to trust someone else. Look at verse 27. When the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and and found 20 fathoms. A little farther they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship, they had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of lowering out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. So the the sailors were were trying to jump ship and and go to the lifeboats. Uh, Paul, seeking to save their lives, told the centurion they must stay in the ship if they're going to be saved. And and this is important, the centurion listened to Paul. So yet again, Luke shows how the Roman representative sides with Paul. Claudius, Felix, Festus, King Agrippa, all have testified to Paul's innocence. And now Julius, the centurion, does the same. Julius puts his faith in Paul and in Paul's God. Yet, Yet again, Luke shows Theophilus. Christians are not enemies of Rome. The Roman representative declares the Christian representative, Paul in this case, was innocent. Number four, we see the deliverance for the sinner. Deliverance for the sinner. Paul cared for all the people on this crew. He cared for the sailors' souls who were trying to flee in the lifeboat. In the midst of the storm, Paul's eyes, hear me, Paul's eyes were not fixed on himself. He was not primarily concerned with his own health, his own well-being. He was concerned for those around him. Look at verse 33. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the 14th day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Paul does something very simple here. He encourages everyone to, to eat some food. You can imagine how weak they were after 14 days of of not eating. They probably didn't want anything to eat because everything they ate probably came back up. Uh, Paul had become a leader of of the ship and encourages them of the coming deliverance. 
For he says, not a hair on your head, not, not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. This is very similar to Jesus' words in Luke chapter 21, when Jesus says to his disciples, you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. Just a friendly reminder that Paul is saying God is in control. Nothing can thwart his will. We as his people must simply endure. Paul gives thanks to God and then eats together. Now, Luke here is not referencing the Lord's, Lord's Supper. Most of these sailors and prisoners would not have been Christians. Some may have turned to Christ. We often see that. We see that in, in Jonah 1, what we read earlier, other, other stories in, in the scriptures. But Paul just gives thanks to God and encourages all who are on the ship. And I just really appreciate Paul's heart here for these sinners. Uh, Paul could have been concerned with his own life, but he was not. He was caring for the souls of these sinners who were on this ship. Beloved, I think we can learn something from the Apostle Paul here. Now, I think too often when, when the storms rage in our lives, we do not consider the lost who are around us. We think that what's going on in my life, and I'm the center of the universe, rather than thinking maybe God has brought this trial into my life for the purpose of those who are around me. How we handle storms of our lives reflect on whether we trust in God or, or not. We, we could be more concerned with our own survival when we face cancer, or we could be concerned with our lost family members, or the nurses who are going to provide us care. If you are in Christ, hear me, you know where you are going. You're bound for glory. You're going to be in the kingdom of the beloved. Do not be afraid. Trust God's word. But you need to help those around you who are bound for destruction. You need to have faith and give them an example of peace in the midst of the storm. Because if you can't trust God in your storm, why should they trust God? We have to trust God when the, the world is raging around us. This is one of the things that I think is so sad for the Christian world. When I look around, I see so many Christians putting their trust in politics. And when politics tend to crumble, they look like they have no hope. Because they're putting their hope in the wrong thing. When life is going chaotic, when our world and our culture is going chaotic, will we trust in God or not? And will the people who don't know Christ look at our lives and say, that person trusts in God or not? How we handle the storms of this life will communicate our steadfast trust in the Lord and will lead people to praise God. This is what Paul or what Peter is trying to show in 1 Peter 1. He says, this, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by the fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. God will sustain us in our storms so that we can help lead sinners to the Savior. Let us not waste our trials. Let's use them to display an unwavering trust in God's Word. Lastly, number five, we see another deliverance, a deliverance ultimately to the shore a deliverance to the shore. God was true to his word. He supernaturally and miraculously spared every life on that ship through the incredible storm. There was no chance for survival unless God supernaturally interceded. Look at verse 39. And when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed the bay with the beach in which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and let them into the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The boat, the boat stuck, remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on the planks or on the pieces of the ship. 
And so it was that all were brought safely to the land. The ship was destroyed, but the souls were safe. The centurion again saves Paul, keeping the soldiers from carrying out their plan to kill the prisoners. Some swam ashore, others grabbed onto pieces of the ship and, and floated along. But that last line, and so it was that all were brought safely to land, just as God has said. You know, the, the problem most often in our Christian lives is that we don't believe God's Word. It's not often that we don't know God's Word, it's that we don't believe it. In, in our, the heart of our hearts, believe what God says. And there's something so beautiful about that last line. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. You know, I have the great privilege to help pe lead people to Christ. I have the great privilege to help people die in Christ. And almost every time I say my final goodbye to the saints of this church, I'll go to them in the casket. I'll go to them in a, in a box. And I'll just silently pray to the Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. One more has made it safely home. The job of a pastor is to help make, help it to make for people to make it safely to those celestial shores. I love how Spurgeon writes, reflecting on Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress. He writes this. He says, "I am occupied in my small way, as Mr. Greatheart was employed in Bunyan's day. I do not compare myself with that champion, but I am in the same line of business. I am engaged in personally conducted tours to heaven." I have with me at the present time, dear old Father Honest. I am glad he is still alive and active. There is Christiana, and there are her children. It is my business, as best I can, to kill dragons and to cut off giants' heads and to lead on the timid and the trembling. I am often afraid of losing some of the weaklings. I have the heartache for them. But by God's grace and your kind and generous help in looking after one another, I hope we shall all travel safely to the river's edge. Oh, how many have I had to part with there. I have stood on the brink. I have heard them singing in the midst of the stream. I have almost seen the shining ones lead them up the hill and through the gates to the celestial city. Beloved, it is not only the job of a pastor to help make it to glory. It is the job of every single one of us. This is the Christian life. Spurgeon says it. He says, I am afraid of losing some of the weaklings. I have a heartache for them, but by, the grace of, by God's grace and your kind and generous help in looking after one another, I hope we shall all travel safely to the river's edge. God has given us one another to make it through the storms of this life. Remember the words of Chesterton I said earlier. We are all in the same boat in a stormy sea, and we owe each other a terrible loyalty. I pray, as we are all in the same Park Baptist boat in the stormy sea of a fallen world, we will be terribly loyal to one another as we labor for those celestial shores to at last see our Savior face to face. Beloved, we are in the business of killing dragons, cutting off giants' heads, and to lead on the timid and the trembling. We are engaged in personally conducted tours to heaven to lead one another to that river's edge. And when we cross the other side, we will see the one who, who controls the wind, who controls the waves. The chaos of this world will be a distant memory and we will see Christ our Savior and we will be at rest. I know the storms may be raging now, but our Good Shepherd has promised us to lead us to still waters. Oh, beloved, trust Him. He is faithful. Father, Sometimes we don't need more of your word.
We need more belief in your word. I pray that for my my church who I love. I pray that whatever they're facing today, they would have a deep, deep, deep trust that you will accomplish your purpose in them. You have already met their greatest need by offering salvation in your son. Oh God, I pray now they would trust you in the lesser things of their life. I pray that they would be like Abraham, who did not waver in unbelief, but was fully convinced that you were able to do what you promised. Oh God, give us the faith of Abraham. Give us the faith of Paul. Help us believe wholeheartedly in the glory and the promise of the words of the risen Christ, that I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. We ask this in his name. Amen.